In 2011, Cormac McCarthy and other board of trustee members at the Santa Fe Institute approved $25,000 from Jeffrey Epstein after he was released from his 2008 conviction for child prostitution. What's up, guys? My name is Ian, and I am a Cormac McCarthy scholar here on YouTube. I've released hundreds of videos on McCarthy on this channel, and I've been studying him for over 15 years. And in 2018, when I heard that Jeffrey Epstein had given hundreds of thousands of dollars to the Institute, moved to Santa Fe because of the Santa Fe Institute, placed members of the Maxwell family on the board of trustees, had his father-in-law, Robert Maxwell, give money to the Institute, host parties for Institute members at the mansion where many of the crimes that are alleged or actually did happen occur, and many other things, I started to investigate. But of course, I was met with roadblocks because when you have an, or an organization like the Santa Fe Institute, you can create a wall that can ref refute accountability. And that's exactly what has happened in my research and my investigative journalism on what happened here. But today, I'm going to share with you guys what we know about Jeffrey Epstein's connection to the Santa Fe Institute and some of its members like Cormac McCarthy, Murray Gelman, and others. So our story starts with how the Santa Fe Institute intrigued Jeffrey Epstein to move to Santa Fe because, and this is from a 2002 New York Magazine interview with Jeffrey Epstein, and it talks about why he moved to New Mexico. Quote, he had it built because of the month or so he found himself spending there, talking elementary particle physics with his friend, Murray Gelman, a Nobel Prize winning physicist and co-chair of the science board at the Santa Fe Institute. And Murray was actually a very kind individual and was the person that helped push Cormac McCarthy to eventually move to Santa Fe also because when McCarthy received the 1981 MacArthur Fellowship, people like Murray were very open to him. They would talk to him for hours about physics, even though he was a random author living in El Paso, some kind of cult hero. And this is when the axiomatic parts of the Santa Fe Institute, they are very libertarian about their approach to science. They don't like what has happened to university STEM programs with corruption and whatnot, and they view themselves as a meritocracy, holding down the integrity of science as an independent institute. And speaking about this, in a 2017 interview with science.org about the Santa Fe Institute, Epstein says, quote, it's night and day, he replied. If you looked at the MacArthur Awards origins, there were scientists like Murray on the committee looking for the world's smartest people. But over the years, big institutions like MacArthur have become politically correct. If you look at their awards in the past five years, they are very concerned with diversity. Now, I'm all for diversity, but I'm for diversity of excellent ideas, not for diversity in the people who receive grants. And if you look at the manifesto McCarthy wrote for the Santa Fe Institute, it's based on this same idea, a heavy focus on meritocracy. And I think Murray and other board members being open to non-scientists who care about science is an important aspect of integrating science into our culture. But unfortunately, Murray made some questionable comments about his relationship with Epstein. And in a 2002 Vanity Fair piece on Jeffrey Epstein, they talk about his relationship with Murray. They include Nobel Prize winners Gerald Edelman, Edelman and Murray, and mathematical biologist Martin Nowak. When these men describe Epstein, they talk about energy and curiosity, as well as a love for theoretical physics that they don't ordinarily, ordinarily find in laymen. Murray rather sweetly mentions that there are always pretty ladies around when he goes to dinner, says Epstein, and that he's under the impression that Epstein's clients include the Queen of England. All right, so that quote looks absolutely terrible, that the reason that he likes hanging around Epstein is that there are always pretty ladies around. And we do know that Epstein threw parties for scientists all the time in Santa Fe, which I would have to assume would include members of the Santa Fe Institute, which was the leading scientific organization in the area and who had many people who are known friends with Epstein working there. And there are probably countless other people that we'll never hear about. What, but what's even scarier about that quote is that they, he also thinks that Epstein's client is the Queen of England. So Murray, like so many others, had been duped by Epstein. Because the Santa Fe Institute is an independent organization that does rely on funding from others. And so in the early 90s, when Epstein falls in love with the Santa Fe Institute and becomes very good friends with Murray, Epstein helps get them some funding. 
And one of the early major donors to the Santa Fe Institute was none other than Robert Maxwell, who was one of the huge media figures in Britain, and a lot of people think it was an intelligence agent. And to make things go even deeper, Ghislaine Maxwell's sister, Christine Maxwell, in the early 90s when Epstein moved there and uh, their father was donating, donating money to the Institute, she became a board of trustee members. And here's one of my big questions that I have asked to countless people at the Santa Fe Institute, and I would love to hear answered. And I've gone over so many different files and would have to have access to their archive to be able to figure this out. But how long did she sit on that board for? Because a couple years later, after she got on the board of trustees, Cormac McCarthy permanently moved to Santa Fe to become a full-time member of the Institute and very soon after that become a board of trustee member himself. So did Cormac McCarthy ever sit on the board of trustees with Christine Maxwell? Because if he did, that would provide another very obvious connection to the whole Epstein circle because one thing we cannot do in our analysis of how the Institute treated Epstein is to claim that they were all ignorant because a key figure in our story is Seth Lloyd, who is a longtime member and professor at the Santa Fe Institute. And in 2021, the tech did an article on Lloyd because Lloyd had kept being very involved with Jeffrey Epstein after Epstein's 2008 conviction and arrest. And in a 2021 article by The Tech, these ideas are explored further. Well, although Lloyd claims not to have known about the extent of Epstein's crimes, this is hard to believe, considering the number of news articles and public lawsuits which were filed during their association. Academics who were in Epstein circles have said that Epstein was very open about the fact that he had two interests, science and pussy, and often had young women hovering around him and giving him massages. One anonymous professor recalled that at a science conference held by Epstein, sometimes he turned to his left and asked some sciencey questions, then he turned to his right and asked the model to show him her portfolio. Lloyd himself confirmed when speaking to student protesters in 2019 that Epstein often traveled with young women, describing it as creepy. Although these academics insisted they could tell the women were over 18, but we can assume some were not. And when you read other articles on Epstein having scientists over, he would have six to 10 young women with him as an entourage walking around his property. And Lloyd was at some of these events. And that is a major red flag, everybody. Let's just be honest here. But look at who we are dealing with. We are dealing with men who were nerds, who were probably neglected by girls like this. And even in their wealth and fame as scientists, really didn't have access to girls like that because they weren't players. And I'm calling them girls and not women because most of them were underage. And Seth Lloyd was an integral member of the Santa Fe Institute. He was on the board of trustees and on multiple other boards with Cormac McCarthy and was obviously friends with Cormac McCarthy because McCarthy was known to be a huge talker and to have conversations with everyone at the Institute. Even if you were just an intern, he would walk up to you and sometimes just chat with random 20-year-olds for an hour or two. So continuing the article, which talks about Lloyd receiving money from Epstein after his 2008 conviction, quote, Lloyd described his receipt of donations as an act of rehabilitation following Epstein's prison term. He elaborated, it wasn't money that I needed. I took it because I thought it was my obligation to do so, because I had said I was going to help him with coming back into society. The true meaning of the statement is that Lloyd directly aided Jeffrey Epstein by taking his money. Epstein was also to evade prosecution for decades precisely because of the web of powerful figures that he developed using philanthropic donations in combination with blackmail, intimidation, and access to his trafficked girls. While some in his social and professional networks, like MIT's AI guru Marvin Minsky, allegedly participated directly in the trafficking ring, others like Lloyd enabled Epstein by growing his network granting legitimacy to the conferences held at Epstein's private island and building his credentials as a science, science ph philanthropist. When Lloyd claims he was bringing Epstein back into society, what he really means is that he was assisting Epstein in strengthening and broadening his network of influence. He cynically cloaks this in language of restorative justice in order to conceal the fact that he enabled a child sex trafficking operation and benefit, benefited from it through a funded sabbatical and access to Epstein's web of prominent publishers. And I'll link this down below for you guys. It's a very interesting article that talks about why MIT didn't punish Lloyd further because he really
really just got a slap on, on the wrist for all of this. But one of the main keys in there that is so important to the connection to Cormac McCarthy and the Institute is that hundreds of other organizations and people turned away from Epstein after his 2008 conviction. They were like, we don't want anything to do with some dude that got convicted with for child prostitution and always has these ladies around. When there's smoke, there's fire. And so they rejected their advances. And when we look at the $25,000 that Epstein gave the Santa Fe Institute, I would call that a probing device. $25,000 is a lot of money, like, oh my God. But for someone like Jeffrey Epstein, that isn't a ton of money, even if his finances were in trouble in kind of that later stage of his life. And by doing these probing attempts and giving money and to guys like to guys like Seth Lloyd, Lawrence Krauss, which we're about to talk about talk about in a second, and SFI, he could once again open his sphere of influence back up and once again continue everything that he was doing. So even though Epstein gave money to the Santa Fe Institute, by them accepting it, he also gained legitimacy, which enabled him, among many other things factors and it's I'm not blaming the SFI really for anything but they are just one of thousands of people who did something similar and aiding Epstein for continuing for another six years when it all could have been taken care of earlier and so before we go further in Cormac's narrative I ask once again why someone didn't stand up because everyone including Cormac because who doesn't love gossip even the top scientists in the world love to talk about this stuff why didn't anyone say I don't think it's good to work with a convicted sex offender and take money from him. because if Kim Jong-un or some terrible person tried to donate money to the Santa Fe Institute, what would they do, everyone? We all know what they would do. They would reject the money. But certain members sat there, and I'm sure there were arguments, and I once again would love the meeting minutes and transparency on who made this decision and how it was made, who was for and against. They sat down and said, we're going to do this. And they knew that it wasn't about the $25,000. And so speaking of Cormac McCarthy and him being very knowledgeable about what was going on with Jeffrey Epstein, because there is a small minute chance that he never had heard of Jeffrey, Jeffrey Epstein in his entire life. We do have a connection here with him being on the board of trustees and the money. But if SFI wants to come out and say he wasn't really involved in any of that, then I would take them at their word and ask them, well, who was that? Anyway, another person who Cormac McCarthy was very close to, who wasn't connected to SFI, but was very connected to Jeffrey Epstein, was Lawrence Krauss. And a lot of you guys hate Lawrence Krauss because of his late 2022 interview with Cormac McCarthy, which was McCarthy's last interview of all time. And McCarthy and Krauss were actually very good friends and had been friends for a while. In 2011, McCra uh, McCarthy and Krauss did an interview together, which is available on this channel. That video is linked above right now on NPR. And it's a pretty good interview. Krauss interjects a little bit too much like usual. But McCarthy also edited two, yes, you heard me, everybody, two of Lawrence Krauss's books and worked with him on countless other things and granted him an interview in his very old age. And our first known reporting of Krauss's connection with Jeffrey Epstein is 2006, where he organized a conference with people like Stephen Hawking and other famous physicists on Pedophile Island, St. Thomas, you know, the St. Thomas Island that Jeffrey Epstein owned. And when talking about this experience, apparently they were all just hanging out, talking about physics and doing all this stuff, but they were six to 10 very young women walking around at all times. So I don't know what happened on that island, but I'm sure with everything we know about Epstein, some of those girls were probably being trafficked and used for intimidation, blackmail, and many other things with some of those scientists. Once again, no one is ever going to admit that, but it obviously could have happened. And it wasn't like Krauss changed his ways after his friend Jeffrey Epstein got convicted for child prostitution, because from 2010 to 2017, Krauss is organization, the Origins Project, which was uh, at Arizona State University, took $250,000 from Jeffrey Epstein. And so we can call that a very big probe. And even worse, with one of the worst quotes of all time on Jeffrey Epstein from anyone. Quote, as a scientist, I always judge things on empirical evidence, and he always has women ages 19 to 23 around him, but I've never seen anything else. So as a scientist, my presumption is that whatever the problems were, I would believe him over, over other people. I don't feel tarnished in any way by my relationship with Jeffrey. I feel raised by it. And this is in 2013. And just to make a quick correction, he actually met Epstein while flying on the Lolita Express in 2002. So 
first of all, that is the most narcissistic and cruel way to ever use science, that Lawrence Krauss, with all of his his experience in physics, can look at a girl and be like, you're 19 to 23, all of you guys, and I know because I'm a scientist. The scientific method has led me to believe this, and he, he says he will believe Jeffrey over other people, and why is that? Why do you think he's saying that? And this is obviously alleged. But I would assume because he was in deep with what was going on with Jeffrey Epstein because Steven Pinker said of Lawrence Krauss that he would invite Pinker to salons and private coffee shops with Jeffrey Epstein where these young women would be present. And what do you guys think happens at those places? What does that lead to? Going to salons and private coffee places in New York City with younger women. And why was Lawrence advocating and trying to bring all these people in? And and because what was the reward at the end to get to know, you know, this random billionaire, I guess, but there was also this inherent motive that women are going to be there. And that was kind of one of the pools. So even if Krauss never partook in any of that, he understood that that was one of the mechanisms being used to draw people in. And when you see women who are in that range from anywhere from 16 to 22, even down to 14 years old. Sometimes people are 14, 15, male or female, and they look like they're 20, 21. Sometimes 21-year-olds look like they're 15. It's very hard to be able to judge someone's age, and especially when they're younger, in like kind of a five to 10-year radius. And there are always exceptions. So that is a very ignorant comment by Lawrence Krauss. And so now rounding back to Cormac McCarthy, in 2018, a bunch of allegations come out about Lawrence Krauss that he told a science colleague to take to date one of the rich donors to take one for a team, offered uh, to have a threesome with one of the people that he was interviewing, tried to get other members of the faculty to go to strip clubs with them, and other sexual harassment stuff. And this was in the 2018 Me Too movement. But one of the things is that Lawrence Krauss isn't some celebrity. He's very big in the science movement. But when colleagues and other people are saying something about, if we're talking about celebrities, he's like a D or an F level celebrity, then there is, I think there's some merit to that. And then when we look at everything that we just heard about, when there's smoke, there is fire. And so the, the, the stories about Lawrence Krauss, among many other people in the Me Too movement, were very public. They were hitting BuzzFeed News, The Atlantic, and so many other news outlets. So when we transport ourselves to 2022, and what are, uh, one other thing to note, the Associated Press and other people reported in 2018 that the Santa Fe Institute took money from Jeffrey Epstein, Robert Maxwell, and the whole Christine Maxwell stuff. All of that was reported and obviously must have been a big deal at the Institute because they had to make statements and give the money back. And there would have had to been talks about what was going on. And at the same time, one of Cormac McCarthy's friends, Lawrence Krauss, was being attacked. And Cormac McCarthy used to read newspapers. We don't know if he does anymore, but he used to go to diners and be seen reading newspapers. And Lawrence Krauss was making national national news with this stuff. So when we transport, and he lost his university position, there was a lot that happened that obviously Cormac would have heard about. Why don't you work at Arizona State anymore? Why aren't you do the, doing this? And so when we go to 2022, Lawrence Krauss offers to do a podcast with Cormac McCarthy. And you would have to think that someone like Cormac McCarthy's son, who is in his early to mid-20s, who attended the lunch with Lawrence Krauss, maybe heard about the stuff if Cormac had it. Maybe anyone in Lawrence excuse me, Cormac McCarthy's circle had mentioned some of this to him. But McCarthy being loyal to his friends decided to do that interview with Lawrence Krauss. But I'm not here to judge him on that, but it is the last key in this whole chain of links to the Santa Fe Institute, Epstein, and Cormac McCarthy because Lawrence Krauss is an independent variable away from the Santa Fe Institute. So one of the morals of this story is how an institution who is seeking freedom from corruption can be corrupted in and of itself. Because obviously university scientific scientific programs, as we've seen over the last couple of years, can be politically manipulated. But organizations that rely on billionaire donors can be manipulated by them. And people who are especially powerful at those institutions can become brainwashed and then advocate to push people who shouldn't be involved at all through. And so, like I said at the start of the video, I would love some transparency on what happened. But I also respect that the Institute isn't going to snitch on the certain people who, who were involved in this because they care about each other, they're a team, and they've made grave mistakes and they don't want to own up to it. So the best way to prevent this from happen happening is to never be around these red flag individuals. Even before his 2008 conviction, Epstein was a walking red flag who was a manipulator, a liar, 
And I just hope that Cormac McCarthy and other people who I love at the Santa Fe Institute saw through that and were just kind of indifferent to his whole role and what it played. But how can you be indifferent when the money that he donated and the influence he brought to the Institute and its members paid for the Institute that you were working 